Good morning, everybody. It's so great to be with all of you today. You know, we serve an amazing God. In spite of everything that we go through, God is still good. And so right now, we want to take an opportunity just to give him glory and honor. So feel free to sing with us if you will. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs. All the glory belongs to you. To you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. Hey, yeah, yeah. Sing all the glory belongs. All the glory belongs to you. To you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. Sing all the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. All the glory belongs. Oh 
All the glory belongs. All the glory belongs to you. To you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. 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 Yeah. All the glory belongs. All the glory belongs to you. To you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. You could have been virtually anywhere this morning, but you chose to be with us, and we are so grateful to spend this time together, worshiping God and lifting him up. So welcome to all of the students and the educators, the working moms and the stay-at-home moms, to those fathers or young professionals who work the nine to five grind, to those of you who are between jobs, to those of you who are building a small business, God comes to teach us endurance. To those of you who work in the medical field or mental, spiritual, and physical health care, to those of you in the armed forces or in law enforcement, God comes to give you encouragement. To those of you who work in insurance, technology, retail, or who work with the young and the old, God comes to teach us how to be unified. To those of you who have lost someone or who have had a child recently, to the newlyweds and the empty nesters, to those of you who are suffering through an illness, to those of you who may be experiencing the best time of your life. Still, God comes to give us all hope so that we might praise him and glorify him. For the scripture reads in Romans 15, one through six. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together and the time that we get to spend worshiping you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this body. Uh, thank you for this, this uh, Kingdom Come series. Uh, we pray that everything that you have blessed us with just build us up and to make you proud and to grow your kingdom. Uh, let nothing get in the way of today. Let nothing get in the way of uh, this good word and let it land on great soil. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's go. Good. Didn't you want to read the scripture again? So, uh, oh, I can spice it. Okay. <laughs> so, but this wants me to read the scripture again. So we gonna do it. <laughs> we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
morning, IE Church. It's great to be together. It's Scott Sweeney from Desert Cities. It's good to be together with Rancho and Riverside as well. We so love our partnership with our three churches as we continue our Kingdom Come series. And today is called Out of Egypt. And we're going to be talking about the famous story of Moses calling God's people out of Egypt. You may have seen that movie growing up, the cartoon version. It's a good one. Highly recommended. I probably saw it about 50 times with my kids as they were growing up, but it was awesome and entertaining. And we're going to learn some great lessons from that today. I know we've talked about the definition of God's kingdom as an alternative, loving, and prophetic community dedicated to following God and trusting Him with their lives. And really, that's the goal of this whole series, to be that community, be God's people in this, in this world, to trust him above all others, to get our identity from him, to find our strength in him, and to trust him, and to be the light of the world that he wants us to be. He created us. He made us to walk and live with him. We heard that from Fatty last week. It was so encouraging to hear that we get our identity from Christ and Christ alone. Today is a powerful and symbolic story that relates to all of our lives. As Moses called his people, God's people, out of Egypt. In that same way, we are all called to follow God today. We're called out of this world to put our trust in him. And as we get started, pray with me. And then we're going to begin in Exodus chapter 3. God, we thank you so much for this time. I pray that you inspire us by your power, by your love, by your grace, by your vision for your people, and the amazing wonders that you did bringing your people out of Egypt. And God, I pray that you lead us to those kind of wonders even today. Get me out of the way. Help us to hear your words. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Exodus 1, verse uh, 3, verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God says. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This is an amazing appearance that God comes to Moses in a miraculous way, a story we're familiar with. But imagine being there and you see this bush burning and not getting burnt up. And you go over and take a look. At this point, Moses had been out of Egypt for 40 years. He didn't even have his own sheep. He was tending his father-in-law's sheep. And so for all intents and purposes, his life was kind of on the downside. It was almost over, you would think, at 80. And yet God appeared to him. It says at Horeb, the mountain of God. And Horeb, the, the, the word actually means desert, destroyed, or desolation. That symbolically, Israel was destroyed and in a state of desolation. But also Moses himself, his life was kind of destroyed and in a state of desolation. That it was, it was barren. It was almost over. He had these visions of doing great things as a younger man, and now he was, he, he had lost that, that spark. 
And yet God waited to speak to Moses until he was ready to listen. That God waited till Moses was at that point in his life. It says that he was the most humble man on the earth. And that was the point when he was ready to listen to God. Sometimes we want God to speak to us. We want him to save us, but we're not ready to really listen. And we'll see that in Pharaoh. We're not going to read about it today, but when you read the story, Pharaoh actually hardened his heart seven different times. And what does that mean to harden your heart? That just means to not listen. Moses would say something that God told him to say, and Pharaoh would just say no, or he would reject it, or he would challenge him. Who are you to talk to me? Who is this God? And sometimes when we hear the words of God, we fight it in that same way. And I pray that today that we are ready to listen, that God can get our attention, that we can carefully look into that burning bush and hear what he has to say to us. That even 400 years later, he reminds Moses that he is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That he promised that he was going to lead his people out of Egypt from a long time ago. It wasn't time 40 years earlier, but it was time now that God never forgets his promise. Sometimes we have a hard time waiting 400 minutes. 400 hours, 400 days, and yet they waited 400 years for the time to be right. That's a long time to wait. I don't think I would do that good with waiting that long, but that was God's plan for that nation, that they started with 70 people and now they had over 2 million, that God's plan was waiting to happen. My point number one is called out of Egypt. And Moses was the prophet to this community. As we're talking about God's kingdom being a prophetic community, that that was Moses' role to call people, call God's people out of Egypt. And really, when you think about that, that's the same role that God has for each of us as members of his community to call people out of, the, out of their Egypt, out of the world, and to follow Christ. And let's read in verse 7 of chapter 3. It says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I have concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? That we learn some amazing things about God and about Moses in this interaction. That we learn in verse 7 that God is moved by compassion, with compassion for his people. That he has seen their slavery, their oppression, how they've been treated. He's heard their cries even. And not, not only does he hear and is he moved, but he is determined to rescue them. That God hears and sees and is moved by what each one of us are going through. That he knows our hurts, he knows our pains, he knows our, our troubles. But not only does he know our troubles, but he is determined to rescue us. And to lead us in the same way into that promised land that he uses that vision of a land of milk and honey, a good and spacious land. You have a lot of room. You'll have, it'll be amazing. And we're going to talk about that later. 
but he calls them out of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world. He calls them from Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler in the world. And when you hear the term Egypt, think of the world well, as it relates to our lives today. That God is calling you out of the world. That he wants you to be different. He wants you to follow him and hear his voice and live his way. And when you hear the term Pharaoh, think of man. That he is doesn't want us to follow people. To want to get our security from people who, who, we're, who, who we're in a relationship with. Who likes us? Who doesn't like us? You know, from even from good people like our family, like maybe our boss or someone in our lives that we care about, sometimes we can make them our God. And he's calling us to not do that, to not let the pharaohs in our lives be our, our gods, but let God be our God. And some of us, we have pharaohs like they had here that were bad, that were oppressive, that were that were you know, hard-hearted, that lied. And sometimes we can even let those people determine our lives instead of letting Christ determine how we live and and what we do. And throughout the the book of Exodus, the Israelites keep wanting to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to this life of slavery. They want to go back to this oppression And sometimes Satan can fool us to make us feel like our slavery was better than life with Christ. What slavery did God call you out of? Or better yet, what slavery is he calling you out of now? What sin has got a hold of your life that won't let go? Today's the day that he's calling all of us out of our sin to follow him and to continue to put our hope in him and not look back, not go back to Egypt and the land that we have escaped. But how do we call people out as we're called to be prophets today in the same way that Moses was called? He called people out by his powerful words that weren't his, but God's. The way we call people out of the world is we give them a different way. We help them to learn God's word and we call them to the truth with love that comes from God. By his example, by our example today, that as we live our lives, we are literally calling people and showing people what a different life with Christ looks like. By our marriages, by our words by our forgiveness that we give to people, by how we treat others, by how we disagree, by how we get angry, by how we apologize. All those things are an example of calling people to a different life and by speaking the truth. So many times people don't say what they really mean because they're afraid. Moses was called to push through his fear because of his love for God to speak the truth when it needed to be spoke and to live and promote God's way. Today we get to promote his way of love to this world. Let's call ourselves, let's answer God's call for ourselves to come out of Egypt and let's call others in this world to follow God and not to live a life here for this life our Egypt. Point number two, inspired towards God's kingdom. God called Moses to inspire his people towards God's kingdom, to love his ways, to appreciate and value and see the value of God's kingdom, his way. Right now, Danielle is going to share a little bit about her uh, her heart and her vision of towards God's kingdom and the value that she sees. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for that first point. I've been so grateful for the series we've been doing, Kingdom Come, and so thankful that I can be a part of it as flawed and undeserving as I am. Each week has been an incredible reminder of the truths of God's kingdom 
and I have been so convicted and inspired personally. I really appreciated Fatty's point last week, light over darkness. I believe God's light shines brightest in the darkest of times. That is why I feel so grateful that God has called me out of my own Egypt, my sin, out of this world and into his kingdom that has never shined brighter to me than it does right now. I love the scripture in Exodus 3 verses 7 through 10. I love that we have a God who hears all of our cries and that he's concerned every time we suffer. One of my favorite qualities of God is in this passage, that our God is a rescuer. We have a God that is so powerful and loves to rescue us when we are going through difficult times. One of my favorite scriptures that I read often is Psalm 18 with the image of God coming down to rescue us. And I love where it says there that he rescued me because he delighted in me. That is so encouraging. And in Exodus 3, verse 7 through 10, it talks about how God rescues us and takes us in to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And that is the kingdom to me today. When everything I could normally put my security in has been stripped away, such as normalcy, a strong economy, a peaceful country, God's kingdom has never meant more to me. That I get to have a relationship with God and every day cling to his goodness, to his love, to his peace, to his stability, that is everything to me right now. That we get to be a part of this spiritual family and that we get to be in a land where people are loving each other, that we're unified and that we're serving one another despite any of our racial backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds or political affiliations. That is such a beautiful land that I get to be a part of. I want to always value God's kingdom like I do right now. I want to focus on all of the kingdom's glory, and there is so much, not on the shortcomings of the men and women who make up the kingdom, because that is there too. I pray that I won't lose this depth of gratitude, but I only pray that despite COVID restrictions, I would do so much more to help others come into this land, this good and spacious land. I want others to see how God is so concerned about their pain, how he hears their cries, and that they could be rescued in the same way that he has rescued me. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much for your sharing there. As we continue, point two, inspired, people to see God's kingdom, to see the value that his kingdom brings, that truly from God's perspective, if you don't see the value of his kingdom, then you're missing the point of life. You're missing the best life. You're missing love. You're missing encouragement. You're living, missing power. You're missing miracles. And ultimately you're missing the, the peace and security that he gives us, that we can only find with him. And ultimately, you're missing heaven in the future. That this was something that I never quite understood. I never saw the value of God. I never saw the value of his word until I saw it lived out in other people's lives. And I started looking to my own life, like, what am I missing how can I have missed this? How can I help my family? How can I help myself? And ultimately, the Israelites were inspired by the miracles of God. They were inspired because they saw so many things happen that they could not explain. They were literally amazed by God. And it wasn't that they didn't have opposition, but God dealt with their opposition. That Pharaoh lied to him four different times. 
As I said before, he didn't listen seven different times. He was deceptive so many different times, and yet they continued to see God work miracles again and again, but it wasn't all at once. It, it was kind of stop and start and stop and start. And sometimes we want it all to happen at the same time. And God just shows us miracles one at a time. But they imagine they, they saw the, the plague of blood, of frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and even the killing of the firstborn of every womb in Egypt. That blew their minds. That God was showing them his amazing power. And yeah, there was probably some fear there of just amazement and respect. But there was also some wonder and a love and safety that God is protecting me. God is protecting us. God is there for us. He's answered our prayers. He heard us when we called out to him. Those special and particular prayers that God answers, there's no substitute for God answering our prayers. I want to encourage you, cry out to God. Pray that he shows himself in your life, and he will. Look for him because I promise you, and He, more importantly, he promises you, if you ask and seek and look for him, that he will show up. And here he show up, showed up in an amazing way. At the end of all of that, when they went across the Red Sea, it says in Exodus 14, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared or honored the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. That God destroyed their enemies. They were afraid for their life as their enemies were coming against them and God protected them. He kept them safe. He inspired them by doing miracles in their lives that they never could have even imagined. They couldn't even dream of all this happening. And you imagine they go out of Egypt. Not only do they leave, but they ask all the Egyptians and they give them all this gold and necklaces and jewelry. And they just plunder the Egyptians on the way out. And then he tells them to go and wander around until they get to the Dead Sea, because it's going to look like they don't know where they're going and the Egyptians are going to attack them. And then God protects them and does this amazing miracle and wipes out everything that held them back. Takes away all the difficulties in their lives. Take, you know, in, in a way, removes every obstacle to them having faith. And that's how it is when we come to Christ. That's how it is when we live with Christ, that he does miracle after miracle, and he shows himself to us in an amazing and powerful way. And even in Exodus 15, they, the first song recorded in the Bible is based on these miracles. In verse 1, it says, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he has been hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank in the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand shattered the enemy that was against us. 
What an amazing song of praise and just like, God, you are amazing. I keep, this is just blowing my mind. Thank you for saving me. You can see it's personal. He became my salvation. He's my protector. He's with me and has made my life what it is. When we're a part of God's kingdom, that's really the heart that we share. Because we know that he has given us the life, that the lives that we have. He's given us the blessings that we have. He's given us the, the, the joys that we have. And the hope and the faith that we have comes from him. In verse 17, it says, You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain of, their, of your inheritance. The place, Lord, you made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. That not only did he get them through the Red Sea and destroyed their enemies, but he gave them this promise of the promised land to come. This says so much about the, the character of God that he wants to bless us, that he wants to encourage us, that he wants to lift us up. Let me ask you this question today. How inspired are you about God's kingdom? How much joy does that bring to your life? How excited are you to talk about God and what he's done in your life? How valuable is that to you? Is anything more valuable? And that's a real question. Because where our treasure is, that is where our heart is as well. Our gratitude, our joy, our zeal, our hope comes from God and the miracles that he's done in our life. He's given us life to the full. He's given us real relationships. He's given us hope, protection, safety, and blessing. Truly, God has given us the most valuable gift. He inspires me to want to follow him, to want to lift his name up because of what he has done in my own life. And this story is not just for them, it is for us as well. Throughout the rest of the Bible, he would continue to refer back to this story of deliverance out of Egypt. He, in the New Testament, he calls all of us slaves to sin without Christ. In the same way that they were slaves in Egypt, that we too are slaves to sin. That they were saved through the blood of the Passover lamb. And in the same way today, we are saved through the blood of the Passover lamb known as Jesus. That they passed through the Red Sea, through that miracle, were saved. The New Testament refers to us passing through the Red Sea in baptism, through the miracle done by God to remove our sins. That they go, they go on from here to go through the desert, which we might call this life. That we have trials, that we have challenges, that we have issues, that we get tested, that Sometimes we pass, sometimes we fail, but we live a life of grace and God always provides. And finally, they entered the promised land, which for us would be when we depart this earth, that we enter the promised land of heaven. It's amazing the same journey that they went through, that God continues to inspire us to follow him even today. In Revelation chapter 5, in verse 9 and 10, we see the end of the story at the end of the New Testament. It says, you talking about Jesus, that he was found worthy to open the scrolls. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God's people from every tribe and language and people and nation. 
You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. That truly this story of being purchased by the blood of the lamb that was slain continues throughout the Bible. That he's called each of us from every tribe and language and people and nation to follow him, to be called out of the world as we then call others out of this world. He inspires us to see the value of his kingdom. And I pray that through our joy and through the spirit that we can inspire others with the value of God's kingdom. Truly, he has given us an amazing and blessed calling that he calls us out of the world. And later on in Exodus, he was going to come down and live in the tabernacle, that his presence was going to come down in this man-made tabernacle that ultimately symbolizing someday when his presence would come down and live within his temple, which is you and which is me. That he would lead us through this life. That the same people that was called out of Egypt were led through the wilderness by God in the same way that he wants us to be led through this wilderness that we call life, to be ultimately led towards him. Thank you so much. Let's say a prayer and we will take our communion together. Father, we thank you so much for this time to come together. Thank you that you called us out of Egypt, out of this world, out of our personal slaveries to follow you. Thank you for the miracles that you put in our lives to help us to see your incredible power. And God, even the miracle that we're here today listening to your word, I pray that we can be inspired by the blood of the lamb that was slain for each of us to show us a different way, a way of forgiveness a way of love, a way of peace that only comes from you. Help us as we take this bread and this fruit of the vine that represents the body and blood of Christ, that we can be moved, that we can reflect and be inspired on how you brought us to this point in our lives. God, carry us through. I know that you will carry us through to the end. Help us to persevere. Help us to have faith. Help us to never give up until we reach the promised land in heaven. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm James Counts, and this is my wife of 28 years, Tanya Counts, and we've come to the part of the service where we get to give back to the Lord with our weekly contribution. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 2 through 5. The scripture reads, In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. You see, today in the midst of our nation, we are in a severe trial. And now there have many have lost their jobs and the economy is suffering badly. Some of us are experiencing severe financial challenges and uh, we're, we're basically, some of us are un unable to give uh, and we can relate to this passage. Even though we can't give much, 
God can do much with the little that we do give. Giving is not about the amount that you give, but it's about the heart in which you give it. Even in the midst of extreme poverty, these disciples in this passage thought it was a privilege to give. The question I have for you and for myself is do we still believe, like these disciples did, that giving is a privilege in the midst of trials? So James and I had gone through financial challenges in the past. Uh, we were in a situation where we were both uh, let go from our jobs. We had to sell our house to move to a state where we could afford to live. There were times when we didn't know if we were going to be able to pay the rent or even put food on the table for our children. And during those times, it felt like a burden to me to give. We continued to give whatever we could and God continued to take care of us. So what felt like a burden ended up being a huge blessing to me because it taught me what it really meant to live by faith. God in turn uh, increased my faith by providing us with everything we needed in spite of the financial difficulties that we were facing. With the little that we gave God, he increased our faith by so much more. You know, we want to make it easy and not a burden to give. You can give in many ways here in the inner empire, by phone, by text, and online. So while we give, again, I hope we can just remember the disciples here that in their extreme poverty, they still gave. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much just for the grace that you give to us of being able to give back to you. Uh, Father, we would have nothing without you, and I pray that we can always remember that, that in our challenges through extreme poverty, Father, that uh, we would still not come before you empty-handed, and just a, a way that we can give back to you because you've given to us so many, so much. Father, we love you so much, and thank you for uh, being able to be our Father, being our Lord, and being our Savior. And we pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.
It's your